Hello, my name is Steve Ayers. I'm here today to present to you how to read a preliminary title report. So we're going to go ahead and get started uh, with this. And uh, what I want to do is the page that's shown up on the screen, we're going to start with items one and go on from there, our explanation of how to read this. So number one is the name and address of the firm that requested the preliminary title report. This normally is our escrow holder that is called to open up the title order. Um, item number two is the name of the individual that requested the preliminary title report, normally known as the escrow officer. Item number three is our customer's reference number. This is the actual escrow number that they've assigned to this particular transaction. Item number four is our title order number. So in this case, it's order number 305-123456-01. Anytime you need questions or concerns, they can reference that number and it'll direct them in, to our internal system to let them know exactly what order we are calling in regards to. Item number five is this paragraph states that we are prepared to issue or caused to be issued a policy of title insurance and the general scope of what the insurance is. Item number six, this paragraph states that the preliminary report is for title purposes only and with no li other liabilities unless specifically requested, this is a report only. Item number seven, this section is the effective date of our investigation of the public records or the date of time which matters affecting title have been examined. Item number nine, this describes the form of the policy contemplated to be issued on this transaction. We're going to go ahead and move on to our next item, which is Schedule A of the preliminary title report. Schedule A, we're going to start off with the estate or interest of the land here and after described to or referred to covered by this report is a fee. In this particular instance, a fee is the highest type of estate or interest an owner can have in a land, freely transferable or inheritable, and whose owner is entitled to the possession. The next item, title to said estate or interest to that date thereof is vested in, this is how your property would be vested. In this particular case, John J. Doe and Jane I. Doe as co-trustees of the Doe Family Trust dated March 16th of 2004. This is your vesting for this particular transaction that's currently have. Your last and final item on Schedule A would be your legal description. This refers to your land in the recorded documents of your county recorder's office shown by lot, track, book, and page number. You can be found here in this, and then below that is your actual assessor parcel number identifying that piece of land. I'm going to move on to the next items here, which would be Schedule B of the preliminary title report. Uh, we'll start off with item number one, which is the property taxes. The property tax official years runs from July 1st to June 30th. The property is taxed as of January 1st for payment in the following fiscal year. Note the installment due dates below in this item references. Okay, so you can see those in your first and second installments. Item number two of Schedule B, a statement regarding the amount and status of the current year's taxes, for etc. Taxes now a lien, now due, or respective installments paid or unpaid. Also, the assessor parcel number is shown on this item. Item number three, if there are property tax delinquencies for a prior year or years, the amount including penalty and interest to redeem prior to a certain future date is shown here. Item number four. Bonds or assessments levied at the inception of construction or improvements, for example, as streets, gutters, sidewalks, sewers, etc., under an approved district are shown here and collected along with the property taxes. Item number five, these are supplemental taxes. State law requires the assessor to reappraise the property upon the change of ownership or completion of new construction. You will find that information there. From this point on, items against the property will be shown chronologically, the oldest first, and so on, thereby reflecting the priority in which each affects the title record. Items six and seven. These are recorded easements, either created by recording of a map or a specific grant. An easement is a right or interest through the land of another, which entitles the holder thereof 
to some use, privilege, or benefit upon over said land. I'm going to move on to the next page here. Item number eight. Item number eight are CCNRs, covenants, conditions, and restrictions. These are limitations and qualifications imposed on the use of a particular parcel of land. Item number nine. This is a deed of trust. A deed of trust conveys title to a particular property to a neutral third party or a trustee with limited powers, such as powers of a sale, for the purpose of securing a loan. The three parties to this document are the trustor, which is the borrower, the trustee, and the beneficiary, which is the lender. Substitution of a trustee, a new trustee was substituted for a trustee named in the deed of the trust. The notice of default is the terms of the trust deed were violated. For example, failure to pay monthly installments, and as a result, a notice of said default was recorded against that property. A notice of trustee sale. This is a delinquency notice in the notice of default that was cured, and this is the next step in the non-judicial foreclosure process. Items 10 and 11. This is a junior subordinate lien. Another deed of trust was recorded concurrent to the previous deed of trust shown in the item 9 and is therefore subordinate. Equity line of credit. This is a deed of trust to secure future advances. If the above deed of trust is an equity line line of credit prior to the close, we will require the following. Evidence that the line of credit has been frozen and no advances have been made after the issuance of the demand for the payoff. And any remaining checks, passbooks, or credit cards issued in conjunction with the line of credit must be surrendered. Item number 12. Item number 12 is an abstract of judgment. This imposes a lien on this and all other real property now owned or thereafter acquired by the debtor until satisfied or expiration of the liens. Item number 13, state and county liens. For title insurance purposes, these liens are treated as though they were abstracts of judgments. Before relying upon release or any subordination, specific statutes should be referred. Item number 14, federal tax liens. Under federal law, any revenue tax unpaid after demand becomes a lien on all property and rights to the property of the person liable. A title company will report federal tax liens not only against the person in title, but against the husband or wife of the persons in title, unless title stood of records of a separate property of the title holder to the date when the assessment was made. Item number 15. This is the item referred to as Schedule A that affects the vesting of the property. Item number 16. This verbiage appears when title to a property is held in a trust and describes the documents the title company will require. Item number 17, statement of information. This is the identity of the seller or sellers that we need to have from a title insurance perspective. Title will not close on a transaction without this documentation and is very important. This not only goes against searches against the property, but against the individual themselves. That is the end of Schedule B. Last but least on a preliminary title report is the plat map. On the plat map, it'll show you the book page, lot, and track, and actually identify which parcel is in question in this report, as you can see by the arrow above. This should conclude the preliminary title report and how to read and understand it. If you do have future questions or concerns, you can always contact your local title representative or call the title officer listed on this report. Thank you for your time and make it a great day.